Welcome back. In this video, we're going to take a look at my experience with switching to Linux as my daily driver. So let's jump in. And if you're new here, hi and welcome. This is Sonoran Tech, where we cover a wide range of tech topics from hardware to home labs to coding and current events. If you like the content, hit the sub button and leave a comment to let me know what topics you're interested in seeing. So I'm pretty sure I have no original thoughts and that applies to switching to Linux too. If you look around YouTube, it's a pretty common topic right now, especially in response to all the noise after Microsoft recall and concerns around privacy, talking about 2025 as the year of the Linux desktop, which they've been saying every year, I think. But then I, I even saw people talking about a 30 day Linux challenge, et cetera. So I thought I was had a novel idea in kind of taking this news and switching, but Apparently not, I'm just one of the sheep like everyone else, but whatever. But let's back up and I'll tell you how I got here, and I like to think I'm not totally sheepish. First, even before all the stuff with Microsoft came out and recall, I actually had to replace the laptop I use for work, and I decided to switch things up a bit after probably 10 to 15 years of using Windows, I decided to switch things up and get a MacBook Pro M3 just to try something new. The experience has simply been amazing. And I won't go into like all the stuff about Mac versus Windows, that's probably for a different video. Now, a lot of the amazing experience is probably because I'm comparing a brand new M3 MacBook to a four-year-old Windows laptop, and that really isn't fair. But anyway, I think that really just broke the seal on trying new things. And when it came to my main PC, yep, like everyone else, I saw all the privacy concerns around recall and I have my concerns with it as well and it did cause me to think about switching but so have various other experiences with Microsoft products over the years ads creeping into every experience in the house we have seen like OneDrive just mysteriously turn itself back on and start syncing when we had turned it off and switched to another product altogether so I was certainly primed to, I guess try something else and I come from a development background and I primarily worked in I would say Unixy environments now if you even go back when I started first job at a school it wasn't even Linux deck Unix on a uh, an alpha system so anyway Unixy environments and I had used Linux as a daily driver probably 20 years ago when I was changing kernels every day and kind of much more involved with, I would say, the community side of it and enjoyed it immensely. I greatly prefer the environment and the command line tools, but just given kind of what I was doing in work and everything else, I didn't think you would be able to replace Windows for certain parts of my workload, in particular like gaming and video editing. But rather than wait and do a ton of research, one day I was just like, forget it. I have nothing else to do. I'm just going to move all of my, my daily non-work tasks over to Linux and see what happens. So for the installation, I decided to go with the dual boot route. I uh, picked up a new SSD and threw it into my PC. And during that process to be super, super careful, I disconnected uh, my Windows SSDs during the installation process. And I remember many years ago when the KDE project started and I was always a huge fan of KDE. So I decided to grab Fedora 40 with KDE and get the installation going, set up my USB with the ISO. And let me tell you, the installation was a huge disappointment. After the install and it was up and running, I had a nonstop notification sound playing in the background. So I had to mute all sounds. I found I couldn't run my ultra wide screen at full resolution. I didn't know why, but some quick searching told me that's because I didn't have the proper NVIDIA drivers. And of course I went through the process of reading random web pages, manually installing the NVIDIA drivers. And I thought, oh, here we are again. I haven't done this for decades and nothing has changed. I'm sifting my way through Reddit threads and you know manually installing drivers. And then finally, when I did get it running, I restarted the machine and there was a new kernel and it was not compatible with the drivers and it just wouldn't boot at all. No error messages, no nothing, and I had to roll back. It was not a good experience. Now, I know using Linux can require a bit more hand-holding, but I was kind of hoping for something a, a bit more hands-off. The Fedora uh, installation was a disaster and I decided Decided to uh, move on from it. Now, I don't know exactly what the problem is because I'm like, look, I'm not going to spend all day debugging this. I'm just going to keep going. I saw all kinds of great reviews on Fedora 40. I don't know what it was. So maybe just something particular with my setup. I did get, give up on Fedora and I decided to give Ubuntu uh, 2404 a shot. Now, I didn't have KDE with it, but whatever. I figured uh, I've been using Ubuntu on my Proxmox system for quite a while, the server version, of course, and I figured I'll give it a try. The 
installer was so much better, just much more polished, much more intuitive about what was happening. It gave me an option to install the NVIDIA drivers right during setup and my resolution was set correctly. It was awesome. And once it was done, the whole system worked right out of the box exactly you, as you would expect. And of course, it even set up Grub correctly, so I was able to boot back into Windows and dual boot with no problem. Nice touch. Uh, it was actually much, much better than I expected, but probably it was exactly what a user should expect out of an installation experience. So congratulations to the uh, Canonical crew on the latest release of Ubuntu, it was very nice. So let's talk through the apps I use every day and how this workflow has changed in the Linux environment. Now the TLDR is that I was able to move most of my workload to Linux with virtually no effort and minimal issues. Now, of course, your mileage will vary on this one, and it's worth checking out all the great content out there that dives into the different use cases on Linux. So if we look at the general productivity environment, we'll start with something simple like web browsers. Firefox and Chrome are there, and they've been there for a while. If you're into other browsers like Brave exists, if you want to try a privacy-focused browser, I used Firefox. All of my extensions, such as password managers, worked perfectly. It was just a non-issue. Browsers, easily covered. Now for Mail, I use ProtonMail, and of course you can access that through the web app, again using Firefox or Chrome, and it works just fine. But I did see that ProtonMail has a beta Linux native application, and I've been using that with no problems whatsoever. Now on the the office side. In the household, we're mostly editing simple Word and Excel documents, which are shared with other family members who are using Microsoft applications on Windows. And I have been using OneNote for personal note-taking. Now I looked around a bit and did some research into different office options. And since I use a Synology as the NAS backbone for the house, I took a look at Synology Office. But for me, it looked like it was really only good for web editing, possibly note-taking, but was kind of too simple for what I was looking for in an office application. Now the go-to move that most people are gonna tell you is like just use like LibreOffice. And that's what I did. Uh, I installed it. And what I found is I've been able to use all of the documents in the house with LibreOffice. And these are just simple like financial documents, simple like Word documents with nothing crazy going on. And I've been able to use them and edit them on Linux, re-edit them on Mac using uh, Microsoft applications, and then also have family members edit them with Microsoft products on Windows. So in terms of like just overall cross-platform, LibreOffice has been fine for our use cases. Now to replace OneNote, uh, I looked around and did some research into other note-taking applications It came across both Joplin and Obsidian. I did try Joplin for a little bit, but really couldn't get it working. I just had some installation issues with it and ended up landing on Obsidian. And I'll tell you, I feel like I've been missing out. If you haven't checked out Obsidian, like go watch some of the other content on it, play around with it. I feel like Obsidian has really been a step up in my note-taking, not like a parallel move from OneNote or even a step down. Obsidian is simply fantastic. And I'll tell you what I really like about it is that it stores all of its data locally in Markdown files. So there's no proprietary format if you don't have Obsidian installed, you could just go open the Markdown file yourself and edit it. People who don't have Obsidian, you could just read it and it'll roughly make sense. And with Obsidian, I just have the Markdown files being stored onto my Synology drive, which then I can access from other machines around the house. Yes, both on Mac and Windows works perfectly. And then we could go on all day about the how much you can customize Obsidian, add plugins, write little code snippets, etc. Simply amazing. I highly recommend it. And then moving on to file sharing, I've referenced this a couple times, but a Synology really is the backbone of the house and is for file sharing and storage. And there is a Synology drive client for Linux. Works perfectly. I installed it and all my files are synchronized. And again, it was just out of the box, as simple as uh, an experience I had with Windows. The one thing I noticed that is different with the file sharing client is on Windows, you can actually go in and effectively like make files or directories like um, ghosted. So you can see like a, a little breadcrumb of the file, then you can say double click on it and it is automatically downloaded and it works and it's pretty seamless. It doesn't appear that there is an equivalent behavior on Linux. If the file is not synchronized locally, you just don't see it. And so what you have to do is go into the configuration, the client configuration, and pick which folders you want synchronized locally and not. So it's a little bit more work, but again, I haven't really noticed it in, in my workflows. Now, I should probably just take a quick second to talk about development. And I think we all know like development is a go-to environment for Linux, so I won't spend too long on it. For me, I use IntelliJ for the Java work I do. You know, it just 
it just worked out of the box, worked flawlessly. I was able to pull my code down from GitHub and it's been fine. Now let's talk about video editing, which is another thing I do a fair amount. Now I thought Linux would completely crash and burn on video editing and I'd have to reboot into Windows to use DaVinci Resolve, which is my video editor of choice. And I did pay for DaVinci Resolve Studio, so I am sticking with that no matter what. But imagine my joy when I found that DaVinci Resolve has a Linux version. I've seen other people talk about that it simply worked easy out of the box. Uh, that was not my experience. It did take a bit of work to get it installed and running. And like I was literally in um, deleting different library versions to make sure the DaVinci Resolve version wa wasn't referencing old libraries. And it was it was back to like find a Reddit thread and the person says delete the following libraries and it worked. And so a bit more hands on than I think the average person would want, but it does work and works very well. And it's able to leverage my NVIDIA card for hardware acceleration. My paid version works just fine. And and the performance is really, really good. There are some use cases which I feel like are faster in the Linux version. Now, there are some small issues with DaVinci Resolve on Linux. Now, let me point out that I'm not a hardcore video editor and there are probably a few other areas that it doesn't do perfectly well. But the one uh, the one problem I hit is that it doesn't support AAC for audio due to licensing issues. Many of the video files that I use use AAC for the audio, especially if I'm recording something on a GoPro. So what I find is I need to bring those files in and then re-encode them before bringing them into DaVinci Resolve. And I've been using Shutter Encoder for this. Works just fine, but it adds another step and more time to the workflow. So it could probably add an hour or two to a workflow where if you're taking 10, 20 gigabytes of say GoPro photo videos and you need to re-encode them with Shutter Encoder, I'm just doing this on a i9 PC with a 3090 Ti video card. Need to go off and they're gonna take 60 to 90 minutes each. So you need to plan for that. And so for some people that may de be a deal breaker where like that amount of time is just not something they want to give up. But for me, not a big deal. I'm not doing this like 24 seven and I can plan around the re-encoding step. But other than that, everything else I do in DaVinci Resolve works just fine. And that comes down to simple fusing, fusion compositions work fine, color correction works fine, and the rendering works fine as well. I haven't hit any issues with rendering, crashes or anything else. Oh, there is one problem, other problem I have seen, and I, I think I noticed Craft Computing pointed this out as well. The window management of the DaVinci Resolve window is completely broken. And so I can maximize it, but there's no, you can't resize the window, you can't minimize it. Once in a while, after I have it full screen, it'll just zoom back to like 80%. I don't know why, I don't know what causes it. And either I just keep running it at kind of that 80% zoom, or I just restart it and it's fine. So uh, not perfect, not out of the box experience but for the amount of video editing I'm doing, it's just fine and it saves me a restart. Now for screen recording, I on Windows, I am using Streamlab and I switched to OBS on Linux. Similar story, works pretty well out of the box. I'm not using extremely complicated use cases. I just do stream recording, simple USB microphone, and that's it. And uh, it works in that case. All right, now let's talk about photo editing. I think this is another one of those areas where for very, very simple use cases, you'll be fine. But if you're a hardcore photo editor and I say, this not from experience but having kind of looked around linux may not be up to snuff for you so for me uh, i am fine with gimp and <laughs> i'm not going to sit here and be one of the people that says if you don't have Photoshop, use GIMP. Like I don't use Photoshop. I really never have because I, I just am not big into, into photo editing. So GIMP works for me, but actually I do most of my work into Canva, which is just a web app and it's simple and brain dead and allows me to make thumbnails. So again, my use case is super simple. So photo editing is not a concern for me, but I definitely know that can be a sticking point for others. And if you're spending a ton of time photo editing and you can't do it in Linux, well, that really kind of is this can be disruptive to your workflow. All right, let's hit the next big one where I thought Linux would crash and burn and that is gaming. Now I had heard Steam was available on Linux, but I didn't believe it would actually work. I mean, I remember using the early versions of Wine and it really wasn't pretty. And so to my stunned surprise, it did work and it worked really well. I installed Steam, I installed Cyberpunk, 
and my save game synced from the cloud and I picked right up where I was on Windows and I was totally blown away. And parts of the performance are actually better in some places like loading from a saved game is much quicker. And for you know a game like Cyberpunk, I don't play a ton of games. It's been just fine, doesn't crash, it's been great. I did have to mess around with the combat compatibility settings uh, a little bit to try other games, but I got other uh, games to play such as like Elder Scrolls Online, uh, New World. And like I said, I'm not a hardcore gamer, but I'll typically load one of these when I want to kill some time and all of them worked. And for me, this is just yet one more use case where I wouldn't need to reboot. Now, if you've gotten this far in the video, you'll notice a lot for a lot of these use cases, I'm not a power user and Linux handles all these surface use cases just fine. I think people start to hit issues when they need to go deep with a certain application or set of use cases. So for example, if you live and breathe in Photoshop, I don't think you're gonna find a good Linux replacement. And for me, I hit that wall with sim racing. And so this is one area where I absolutely am a power user. I have all kinds of specialized hardware with you know, wheels, pedals, button boxes, etc. And if you know anything about the sim racing world, iRacing really is the go-to app and running it on Linux is a non-starter. I didn't even wanna try. Automobilista 2 is technically certified for Steam, but I couldn't get it to work at all. And I really didn't even try. Oh, and most of my sim racing is done uh, using VR and a Varjo base headset, which is definitely outside the norm of configurations. And I was like, forget it. This is where uh, an area where I'm perfectly happy rebooting once in a while to drive some cars around, it's fine. So that's been my experience so far. Virtually all of my workloads have moved over seamlessly and I pretty much spend all of my time in Linux. I'm beyond impressed. And yep, once in a while I have to reboot for some sim racing, but that's okay. Maybe recall can help Help me analyze my sim racing technique and shave off some left. And so the question is, should you try it? Now, obviously that's a very personal decision, but you can do it without even a full install running from a USB drive, so why not? You can do a bunch of research to find out what apps work or replace what you have, or you could just jump in and figure it, figure it out. Personally, I think it's worth a shot simply for the learning experience and developing a new perspective. And that's it for now. I'd love to hear your thoughts on switching. Go ahead and leave your comments below and we'll see you next time.